Coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. Well, hello, hello, Belieflings. On today's episode, we pull out the pickaxe and make room in the belief hole for a fellow intrepid explorer of the bizarre and the unexplained. Tony Merkel from the Confessionals podcast joins us as we dissect some conspiracy culture and recount true tales of coyote chomping dogmen, wounded sky beasts, alien abduction, and Bigfoot bigotry. So turn up the volume and open your mind as we set out into the void. Synchronicity, Sasquatch, Homunculus, Alien Races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Like, Close the door, in. Jury! Close your door! What's the uh, Inner Earth Disagreements? Ghost Dad! <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Magicians are Demons, Specters, Spirits, Sleep Paralysis, Strange Disappearances, Sky Whale Phenomena, yes. Alternative History, Shadow People. Shh, quiet, I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf Towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Hello, hello, gentlemen. Welcome, Beliefflings, one and all. We have a special episode for you guys today that we're super excited about. Yes, long time coming. Yeah, we had an opportunity to record a conversation with Tony Merkel of Merkel Media and the Confessionals podcast. We had a great time. What, what? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it was an excellent conversation. We talked uh, all things strange, some of our favorite stuff, sky creatures, dog man, smoke monsters, mm-hmm. some personal stories, some UFO abduction. Yeah, ran the gamut on all kinds of strange and bizarre things. It's kind of a unique opportunity for us, unique conversation. We think you guys will really dig it, and we hope you do. And uh, be sure to check out Tony's show and tell him we sent you. And I guess without further ado, we bring you this week's episode. Well, hello, hello. I'm John. I'm Chris. And I'm your third host, Jeremy. And there's someone else here. There's someone else on the line. Yep. There he is. <laughs> I'm Tony. Mr. Tony Merkel. Yes. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on the show, guys. Oh, thank you so much for joining us in the Belief Hole. This is kind of a unique experience for us. Uh, we haven't done any real crossovers, but I've been following your show for a while, and I had a couple people reach out and say they wanted to hear if we could ever possibly do kind of a, a, a conversation, because you've had so many interesting people on your show. And when I went to check you out on the old uh, podcast app, I scrolled through, and I realized you are the handsome devil that's been shushing me all this time. <laughs> that's your logo. And I was like, that's Tony. That's the confessionals. And I checked it out. And man, that was a while ago. And I've really grown accustomed to listening to your show. And what I love about your show distinctly, such a reliable source for original stories, long form interviews. And that's distinct from us because what we do is storytelling, we really get into the sound design and, and do immersive sound design for the stories, the research. And we kind of hodgepodge stuff in kind of a corroborative way to bring different stories together. But you pull original content from the source on a regular basis. And I just, I find that awesome, man. So thank you for joining us today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And yeah, I mean, I just have fun talking to people. And uh, when I started the podcast, I'm sure you guys do the same thing where you're thinking about what do you want the show to be? How do you want it to be? Like, it's obviously you guys did that with the production value you guys have. And when I first started podcasting, I was trying to pretend to be a journalist. You know, I'm writing down all these questions and like, oh, let me ask this engaging <laughs> question. And it just wasn't natural for me. And I was just like, I'm just a conversationalist. I just talk to people. And I'm just going to start talking to people and stop pretending to be a journalist. Like, I got to draw out things. I'm just going to talk with them. Yeah. And and it just kind of hit me the one day. I'm driving my truck at work and I was like, you know what? I just want to be the Joe Rogan of Paranormal Podcast. I just want (laughs) to sit down and talk to people. If I can get a Joe Rogan audience, great. But if not, at least it'll sound kind of similar. Just the paranormal (laughs) angle. Yeah, for sure. I, I think you get a surprising amount of information, especially when it comes to paranormal. It's just interesting to hear all of the surrounding context for what people are going through. And sometimes you pick up pieces. And I've heard you do this in your show where they may be describing what they're experiencing. And then you might be like, I think what you're telling me is you're essentially an experiencer. This is something that's maybe attracted to you over a long time, or there may be more to this story based on how much you're telling me and what's going on. So I like that about your show. It's not just grabbing bullet points and spitting stuff out. 
Yeah, I, I'm not good at that. You know, I was a bad student. I'm not good at structure. I'm not good at planning and all that stuff. That's my wife. My wife is like my other part of the team here. And it's because she's good at the organization side. I'm just like, let's just have fun and go, you know? <laughs> and so I was uh, in Kentucky recently with my team uh, doing a Dogman documentary. And uh, one of the cameramen, he told me, he's like, dude, you're a visionary. You're really good <laughs> at just having the vision and going with it. But you need people around you that have more structure and, and see how to connect A to B to C because you're like on A and you see Z down the road where nobody else can see it. But we're here to help you get to Z. I'm just like, that works. Sounds good, man. So- <laughs> <laughs> right. Helping you build the roadmap. Yeah, we yeah. could use some of that. Helpers to build the infrastructure. We some- can borrow those, right, Tony? <laughs> Bar your wife. Yeah. Bar your wife. That's not a well, Get right. your own wives, boys. Get your own wives. <laughs> Great start. So Tony, let me, let me ask you specifically about the direction of your, you know, your confessional. You're having people tell these stories, these strange accounts. Why the strange? Why the paranormal? I think we all have our own experiences of things that occurred maybe in our lives or what influenced us to go in this direction, the curiosity, the intrigue. What was it that led you to choose this route in podcasting? All right. So that's a... Uh... Loaded question. Thanks for coming right out with the heavy hitters. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Uh, so I was always interested in Loch Ness Monster when I was a kid growing up. Oh, Nessie. I was fascinated by this monster, this ancient sea monster, all that stuff. I was also interested in the idea of Bigfoot. And when I was growing up, that's what me and my friends would talk about, you know, how we were going to hunt these things down one day. And you know, I move away, we get older, you go into high school, you go to uh, just life happens. You don't even think about the stuff until years later. I, I get married young. I'm at 21 years old. I get married. I'm at 25 now. And I'm starting to like, uh, I need to find something to do with my life. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, just going to work and coming home. And I'm just like, uh, and so I started watching some TV and you, you start finding the monster quest and all that stuff. And I'm like, oh man, I remember looking at this stuff when you're a kid and I started looking in the Bigfoot again and uh, started dabbling with that online and things like that. I started a Facebook group. It was called Pennsylvania Sasquatch Research. There was no research involved. It was just like, I didn't know what else to call it. And (laughs) I just thought, man, if I could find like 20 people in Pennsylvania that are interested in the topic and I could talk to them about it, it'd be kind of cool. And the freaking group grows to be like 500, 1,000 people. And it's just like, people are asking me, they're saying, well, what do you think about this? I'm like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I was here to learn from you guys. So <laughs> I, I guess, I guess that's kind of where my mindset became with this kind of stuff as well, where I don't really come into my show thinking we're going to educate people. I just have conversations with people and through talking with people, I learn just like mm-hmm. I did back in the day with the Facebook stuff. Um, but I will tell you, there is a little bit of a more of a supernatural angle to the origins of the show that I haven't talked about a whole lot over the years, but I started talking about recently. Who do tell? Yeah, it, it it was one of those things where I just didn't feel like in my gut it was time to maybe talk about it or something. I don't know. It's just something I felt like something was holding me back from talking about where I, I just it wasn't the right timing yet. And uh, recently, I've been feeling more not comfortable. I've always felt comfortable with this. It. Just I just feel like more in my gut, like, okay, it's time now. Um, I was running the Facebook group. I was in the Bigfoot stuff. Anybody who listens to my show, I mean, I'm sure you guys know, I, I'm not shy about saying I'm a Christian. And I'm driving my truck at work and I'm thinking about this Facebook group I'm in that I started and how a lot of the people in the group were saying things like when they go into the woods looking for Bigfoot, it's like a spiritual experience for them. Mm. And it didn't really sit right with me. I was just like, uh, huh? Like, I was just <laughs> like, that's a little different for me, you know? And I, I was praying about it in my truck. I mean, I used to drive tractor trailer and I was just praying about it. Like, I don't know if this is what I'm supposed like the people I'm supposed to be mingling with. I don't know. Like, I've never talked to people like this before in my entire life, you know? And uh, I really felt God tell me, like, it was like a gut feeling, like a, a Holy Spirit speaking to my spirit kind of moment that he placed me in this community for a reason. And so I'm like, okay. So I, I go home. I tell my wife, I'm like, hey, this is what I feel like God's kind of telling me. And then time goes by and um, I'm driving my truck again one day at work. And I'm not even praying. Like, this just happened. Like, I'm just like, I don't know. I'm probably listening to some good uh, Darius Rucker or something. And I, I'm going down in Philadelphia. And out of nowhere, I just feel God speak to me again and say, you're going to start a podcast and you're going to work with 
Wes Germer from Sasquatch Chronicles. And I'm just like, what? I never even talked to the dude. Like, I listened to his show here and there, but I like, what? You know? So I went home per tradition. I just go home when I feel like something like that happened. And I talk to my wife about it. And I just tell her so that she's just somebody else that is witness to what I felt in the moment. And I kid you not, like a month later, I back my truck into the dock at work and I'm getting ready to be done for the day. And my phone starts ringing. Facebook Messenger, Wes Germer's calling me. What? Never talked to the guy in my entire life. And uh, we talked for like 45 minutes. And in the first conversation, he said that because at the time I had the Facebook group and I had just started a YouTube channel where I was kind of like just talking about Bigfoot and stuff. And um, in the first conversation, he's like, dude, I think you'd be a good podcaster. And um, I was like, I already knew you were going to say that. (laughs) (laughs) God told me, buddy. Yeah, I didn't tell him that. I told him that probably like because him and I became really close friends. And uh, I told him that probably like a year or two later. Maybe not that long, Maybe, but probably about a year later, I told him, I was like, okay, man, I got to tell you something. I feel like we know each other well enough that you're not going to like, you know, run away from me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I I told him, but um, that's what I mean when I say why I started doing it. It's like a supernatural thing. Like I had these interests. I had interests in cryptids. Uh, I didn't really mess a whole lot with alien abduction and the paranormal type stuff. But when you feel like you're being commissioned to do something on a supernatural level, you just kind of go with it. And uh, that's where I'm at. I don't feel like I'm anything special. I just think that this is what I'm literally supposed to do with my life. And so here I am doing it. That's fascinating, man. And that is not what I was expecting at all. I figured. <laughs> I mean, to have such a direct message like that, I would love a direct message. I'm jealous. Because I, I question things all the time, especially with the show. There's so much weird stuff that we get into. You never know. We collect a lot of books. I have a lot of research and I love dissecting into the history and looking at different, you know, when you're, when you're doing the research stuff, you're really getting into corroborating accounts. Yeah, and, corroborating accounts, but also esoteric stuff. And there is an energy around that stuff. For sure. You know, that yeah. makes me want to ask you a question, Tony. It's League of Legends, right? You're doing the Dogman? Legion of Legends. That's right. If we did League of Legends, I think I'd get sued. So Legion of Legends it is. <laughs> just, I thought, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is the other thing? What is the other thing I keep thinking? League of Legends? Is that the... Hammer Lane Legends is the truck driving podcast. With your dad, right? Yeah. Now, what's the thing you get sued for? What is that? Well, I mean, if I called Legion of Legends, if I called it League of Legends, that's like a whole superhero franchise thing, isn't it? League of Legends? Yeah, that's why I confuse in my brain. Legion of Legends. <laughs> Yeah, I, ca- I probably could have picked a better name, but it is what it is at this point. No, no, it's good, man. Uh, I like the whole uh, Legends because then you have, was it, it's Hammer Lane Legends, right? Is that what it is? Yeah, my wife told me I got to lay off the Legends. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, man. It's a strong word. It's what we're looking at. Yeah. You know, there wasn't all this terminology back when we were looking because we, we grew up thinking about the same stuff when it came to Bigfoot, ghosts, UFOs, Loch Ness Monster specifically. I did a report on in sixth grade. It was career day. It was back in the 90s, early 90s. Yeah, yeah, it was 96. And I want to know, can I be a cryptozoologist? Like I knew the word. Wow. Because I'd seen it on some documentary, probably like In Search of with Leonard Nimoy or something, some rerun. There was one school in California that actually had a degree or actually, no, it was a class. Of course, it's not going to be a degree yeah. major in that. In cryptozoology. I was going to say. But so we've always been fascinated. So when I, I, you know, I heard you talking about that, it sounds very similar to how we started, just this kind of early fascination with those. And back then it was Bigfoot, UFOs, Loch Ness Monster. Those were like the three heavy hitters. And now it's opened this door into, of course, Dogman, oh, yeah. the severe high strangeness. Yeah. Sky creatures, you know, all kinds of stuff. But, it, but your story specifically made me want to ask you the question about Dogman, because I know that that's what you, you went down to Kentucky, right? With Legion of Legends? Yeah, we freaking went into the Daniel Boone out there at night. And the whole goal, the ultimate goal of the trip was to bag a dog, man. That's what we were there to do. <laughs> that is insane, sir. <laughs> like, we're not like, oh, we want to catch it on camera. We want to see it. We're like, no, we want to kill it. We want to kill it and bring it home. And Yikes. We, we were, what if it was a good dog, man? What if it was like a nah, you know, man's best friend, Dogman? I don't care. <laughs> Have you heard any of these accounts? Listen, I feel like Dogman could slice you I've in I've been half. alone in the woods at times after looking at this stuff when I got first like addicted to the Dogman stuff like five years ago. And there were times alone when I would ride my bike because I'm an adult man. I rode my bike home and uh, I would drive past a cornfield and think like this could very much be real and I could very much be dead. So I, going into Kentucky, into the heart of Dogman country, just sounds like an insane... Well, that brings up an interesting question. Tony, are you of the ilk of... I know when it comes to things like Bigfoot, Dogman, um, I think even more so Dogman, 
there are definitely different tribes of people who believe different aspects. And some people are very firm on this. Like, and this goes back to the supernatural thing you were talking about as far right. as like kind of the Bigfoot worship, like it's a spiritual experience. There is a question I have about the dog, man. There's three possible realities. One is that it's it's just a basic cryptid. It's a Bigfoot. It's a, a bone, blood, and fur creature. Biological animal. Biological. It's just hiding, maybe living in caves, coming up to feed or whatever. Then there's the possibility that it's supernatural. Here we refer to that kind of dog man as a, a fear eater or a nightmare feeder because there does seem to be this hypnosis type effect that there are certain encounters where people are drawn into this thing, whether it's tapping on the window or there's some kind of almost demonic essence. And you could say maybe it's infrasound, like some large cats have that can draw you or, or paralyze you. Maybe it is, but there does seem to be, especially with a skinwalker, which is kind of a different thing, of course. But well, I think also the fact that like there, there are so many accounts where they seem to be fine. There seems to be this menacing aspect to this encounter, but yet they leave okay. Where it's almost like right. the point was to draw the fear. Just to scare you and almost feed off that fear. So I guess my question to you is, do you have an opinion on that? Do you feel like they're these are just like large bipedal wolves running around, canines in the in the wilderness hiding underground or whatever? Or do you think there is a supernatural aspect that maybe could even verge into spiritual in maybe a darker sense? Because that's what a lot of times they seem to be. I don't even believe in dog, man. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been great, Tony. We will talk to you. <laughs> oh, man, no. All right, so I started in the last, uh, I'd say, three to five years on a spiritual level calling myself a hybrid. Like there's people out there that, oh, I'm Pentecostal. There's other people, I'm Baptist, I, I'm Catholic. I, I, I'm a hybrid. I, I'm a mixture of a lot of different things. And it's because I take an information from a lot of different places and not one source of information for me is like a beginning and end, you know? Right. And so when it comes to this kind of stuff, I'm very similar. I think there's a lot going on here. And I think it would be really bad for... Not that like our opinions matter as podcasters, but I think as people who are hosting platforms and thought and all that stuff, I think it might be bad for us to try to just box things into one particular thing just so that maybe we feel comfortable yeah. or it's within our understanding. I think that when it comes to... Let's just keep it on Dogman. I think there's a lot of different things going on here. So I, I think that Yes, I think that Dogman is physical. I think that episode 335, Dog vs. Dogman, is a legendary episode of mine on my show. Kyle's out in the woods. He is in Kentucky. He's the reason why we went to Kentucky. We went to go to the location that this happened at. He's 15 years old, I think. He goes out into the woods. He's hunting raccoons with his grandfather. His grandfather stays in the truck, not in the best shape. They let the dogs go. The dogs get on scent. They take off. He goes into the woods after the dogs. He's obviously behind them, though. They hear coyotes coming in as the dogs treat a raccoon. So I guess by the different types of barks, you can tell what the dog is doing. The dogs treat a raccoon. Coyotes start coming in, and you hear a fight break out. His grandfather told him, get in there before the fight breaks out because it's not going to be pretty. And uh, the fight breaks out. One of his dogs runs away. You can hear the dog run away. So now he has his dog, Jake fighting these coyotes and Jake was like a legendary dog in the area. He was the best hunting dog of everybody's dogs. He was the best and he was big, just did his job well. So this dog fights off these coyotes and he goes back to treeing the, the raccoon and you hear the coyotes come back in as a group this time because I guess he came in more, I don't know, in spurts. Jake's getting his butt handed to him at this point. You could hear it. And then Kyle said that he heard his other dog, Bo, come in and the fight changed. The coyotes run off, scared. He comes up on the tree. His dog is back to treeing the raccoon. He comes over, pats him on the head. Good boy. Good boy. And he hears his other dog on the other side of the tree chomping down on a coyote. So he walks around the tree and it wasn't his dog that was chomping down on a coyote. He said what he saw was a gigantic dog on all four, so big that it was holding a coyote by its rib cage in its mouth. What? And he came up on this thing and it saw him, it stood up on its hind legs, he ran and then it took off after him. Freaky. So the story ensues from there where this thing was very physical, chasing after him. It got at one point so close to him where he could actually see down its throat. So for Kyle, this thing is extremely physical. 
and to this day, Kyle says, these are just creatures that exist in these woods. They are just animals that exist in these woods. So how do you argue that? Because that's his experience. Right. He saw something that wasn't supposed to exist and it was very physical. It was eating a coyote and it wanted to eat him or at least kill him or hurt him. That's what it seemed like. Yeah. There's obviously lots of different theories and thoughts you can go into where maybe it was just trying to scare him out, whatever. But then there's other people who talk about seeing Dogman. For instance, the guy in Florida, I can't ever remember his name. Uh, he, he's a black guy. Um, and he was on a, a Facebook Live like two years ago, I believe. And he was talking on his Facebook Live about what he had seen out in his yard. I guess he had posted pictures of something on his Facebook. And so while he's on live, he goes out his door to show people where the pictures were taken to show on video. And as he's shooting video, there's this gigantic, what you can say is a dog man run by the-, the <laughs> What are you talking about? Yeah, it, it ran by a, a light post. So the thing is like, he freaks out. He continues doing his live inside for like 30 minutes talking about what he saw. Then he posts the live. Like it was very organic because he was doing a live. I, I don't know. I'm not very tech savvy. So maybe he could manipulate things. Maybe he could lie. But here's the thing. What shows up on video is something that seemed very metaphysical where you yeah. physically can see it. But at the same time, it didn't seem like it was all there. It was translucent. Maybe it was running that fast, but it didn't seem like it was running so fast that it would be that. So then there's that angle. And then there's the angle of people who are in their bed at night and they're having maybe a paranormal experience. I always refer to this because it's probably one of the first times I heard this and it wasn't even on my show. It was on a, a radio show. And this guy calls in and he says that that him and his wife were having a really bad argument and they usually didn't go to bed angry, but that night they went to bed angry. While they're laying in bed, they're both awake, pissed off. They both start seeing these red shapes appearing at the bottom of their bed, like on the wall. And he says to her, are you, are you seeing this? And she's like, yeah, I'm seeing this. Something inside of this guy said, look to your left. He felt like he needed to look to his left. He looks to his left. And there is a gigantic dog standing on four legs, staring at him with red glowing eyes. Ugh. So that's like a, what, a demon dog, dog man? A hellhound. Exactly. Hellhound. We hear people talk about these things being outside their homes. The next thing you know, they're inside their home. We hear all these different type of traditional paranormal angles to these things that other people swear are physical. And so you could tell me that dog man is physical. And I'd say, yeah, I could see that. You could tell me Dogman is supernatural. I could say, yeah, I could see that. You could tell me Dogman's both. Yep, I could see that. You could tell me that Dogman is physical, supernatural, both at the same time. But what that guy saw in his bedroom wasn't a Dogman. It was a dog demon or a hellhound. I could say, yeah, sounds good. Exactly. So, <laughs> that's I, don't what I, mean. what, like, I don't know what that quote is, but that reminds me of the, the quote of something about there are more strange things between heaven and earth. Remember that quote? There is so much that we don't know. And to pin it all under dog man is this, or this is a dog man, just because it's a, you know, canine like creature, whether it's metaphysical, supernatural, purely physical, there could be overlaps. Like I do think that there is a possibility that something like, you know, there are people that are very cut and dry. Bigfoot is a real physical animal, human type, maybe some missing link. Right. Potentially. Yeah. Uh, then there are people that like, well, he steps through portals and, uh, goes between dimensions. And I think that there is a definitely a possible reality to that. And that goes back to obviously Skinwalker Ranch and stuff. Well, I think it would explain a lot of, you know, on our show, we try to do an open-minded take on a lot of these stories because we don't know. And that's kind of the whole point. Yeah. Just like you said, the idea that there's, there's one single answer to this, I think is kind of crazy. Right. And one fascinating little bit about the dogman specifically, because this is, I think this one gets overlooked a lot. I'd love to talk about this more, but if you've ever heard of the sinocephali? <laughs> Sign of cephali. It's not ringing a bell. Or sign of cephali? Gesundheit. Okay, so <laughs> I may not even be pronouncing it right, but when I was looking at the Dogman for a previous episode, it's fascinating to look at historical records because we try to do that from time to time. And yeah, Dogman's been kind of your thing, Jer, from since we started the show. Yeah, I'm a Dogman guy. Yeah. You got me fun of a lot by a lot of our yeah, friends. Yeah, I would go to Starbucks where Chris worked and people would be like, oh, you're the guy that believes that there are dog-headed men running around. <laughs> you're also the flat earth guy. Yeah, well, I don't talk about it anymore. <laughs> I keep some things to myself as we go on. Uh, but I'm open-minded. I'm, I'm, no, I'm open-minded too. Earth-shaped agnostic, But I still, get, I still get questions from people that are like, 
So your brother, does he really believe the Earth's flat? Right. They had access to episode one before he vanished that episode. We almost got a lot of subscriptions from Tony's audience until you said that, John. <laughs> I'm like, this guy. Uh, this no, guy. I'm just open to all ideas, okay? No, I'm not. I'm not. I just thought it was funny. So this is interesting. You might find this interesting, Tony. The sinocephali or sinocephali, I'm not exactly sure what the correct pronunciation is, but it was a tribe of dog-headed men that were referenced by the Greeks. And this is fascinating because you do from time to time hear accounts of dogmen that do not fit the kind of werewolf freaky concept, whether it's supernatural or physical. These guys are on the sides of the road wearing trench coats, smoking cigarettes. They get found out in a trailer park talking to each other with wife beaters oh, that's on. That's a fascinating story. There's all kinds of interesting stories where they just almost seem like regular folk, but they're underground. And so there is this lost tribe of people that existed in like, I think, Northern Africa. And the fascinating thing is when I was looking into this, so scholars today will say, this is a quote, the legend probably originated in ancient travelers' accounts of African baboons, which were mistaken for a tribe of men. And in that same article, there is a quote from Theseus, the Greek historian from the fourth century BC, and he says, quote, on these Indian mountains, there live men with the head of a dog, whose clothing is the skin of wild beasts. They speak no language, but bark like dogs, and in this manner make themselves understood by each other. The sinocephali living on these mountains do not practice any trade, but live by hunting. And this is where it gets interesting. When they have killed an animal, they roast it in the sun. They also rear numbers of sheep, goats, and asses, drinking the milk of sheep. They eat the fruit of the Cyptocora, whence amber is produced, since it is sweet. They also dry it and keep it in baskets, you know, just like baboons do, I oh, guess. Oh, yeah, they do that with baskets uh, all the time. <laughs> so these are not baboons, right? Well, yeah. These are people, this is a culture that existed at a time. There's all these different references to dog-headed men throughout our history. And this would be a third type, of course. This wouldn't be what we're experiencing in the woods unless they've gone totally rogue and crazy. But right. I, I do think that there are all kinds of possible explanations, different kinds of phenomena that explain the dogman or different dogman experiences. I think it's the way it is with all paranormal things. It oh, seems for sure. like, you know, ghosts, any phenomena you can imagine, it seems like... It could yeah. be anything, and it could be all of them at the same time. Yeah. yeah, You know, depending on your belief system and your background, you might have a different perspective on supernatural experiences. Ghosts, disincarnate souls, are these trickster entities? Is it an echo of time? Yeah, and it's fascinating because there's so many examples in history, like whether you're talking about Marcello Bacci, we did an episode on that, which I thought was fascinating, where he, he was the grandfather of ITC, intertranscommunication, where he had the spirit radio where they had people come and test this. They could not figure out if it was a fraud, how he was doing it. But he was tuning in voices from somewhere else. Right, voices from somewhere else. And like, you know, there's always a controversy of like, is this my loved one who's passed? Or is this somebody pretending to be this? In that example in Italy, it seemed to be an overwhelming feeling of it was the authentic person. But the aspects around this stuff and the aspects around the skull experiment, things like that, but there's always fascinating concepts behind, for example, where are they? Because we have the heaven idea. We have the, is there a limbo? And you hear these recordings, there's wind involved. Do these things necessarily exclude each other? And I think that's what's interesting. And I think we're all on this journey to figure out, or not, maybe not even figure it out, but explore the possibility. I think just to understand that there's something beyond what we're taught, the right. material reality. Be open-minded. Yeah, there is more. Yeah. Well, Tony, let me know what you feel about this idea. I feel like the more we do the show, the more things that we discuss when it comes to the supernatural or the cryptid things or, or whatever, anything that we're viewing in our reality on a day-to-day -day basis and any strange Fordian experience we might have, there is, of course, the concept that what you see is what you see, what you see is real. But there's also the idea that your brain is either something that creates consciousness. The biology of your body and the biology of your brain creates the necessary things to allow you to experience consciousness, awareness, and that there is no soul. It's all just in your head. Right. And then the way that we tend to see things, it seems like the research lends to this idea too, is that the brain is a governor, a filter, a filter per se. Like you might receive consciousness and awareness of soul, but the brain is filtered. It filters out certain... Uh, Perceivable reality. Exactly. And that to me explains a lot of the situations of people seeing things that others can't or people having experiences maybe other people don't have as often or at all. But I always felt more like our world is less materialistic as it seems like we live in an age where it is like kind of that's it. What you see is what you get. That's kind of the mainstream view. Yeah. There's a lot of people waking up to at the same time, though. I feel like there's this mm -hmm. swell of people that know that there's more. Too. Tony, I was going to ask you on that point. Are you still seeing those white flashes when you close your eyes? I heard. No, it. not as. So when I recorded that, you're talking about the interview I just put out this week, right? Was, I think it was with Emmett. Yeah. When I recorded, I recorded that back in June, I think it was this year. And so it was uh, a little while ago. 
And I haven't had that happen, but I've had an astronomical amount of people email me to tell me (laughs) that they've had that experience too and that they hear the loud bangs right before they fall asleep, which is the exploding head syndrome. Right. And I I guess I didn't say that on the show. I knew what it was and stuff. Maybe knowing that I'm going to play this for my audience too, I'm just letting you guys know as you're listening, I do know about the exploding head syndrome. So, um, you know, maybe let the inbox breathe a little bit in my emails. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> they were informing me that, you know, this is what this is. And I'm like, holy crap. I didn't, I, I didn't expect that kind of reaction. Cause like, I mean, you, you get emails and stuff, but like, I, I can't think of one thing that I've ever said on my show that has gotten so many people emailing me to just to help me out. You know, <laughs> I was just like, this is kind of cool. You know, <laughs> I was just like, okay. But, um, yeah, I'm not experiencing that. At least I haven't, but I've had other weird things happening. Uh, before we get into that, though, I just want to kind of bounce off of what you guys were just saying about the whole yeah. brain filtering thing. I agree with you. Uh, and, and that's a that's a great way of uh, of maybe describing it, because that's the one thing that you know I do with my show is that it, I just talk, and sometimes I don't have the best way of describing things in the moment when I'm recording, and that's a great way of describing the brain filtering aspect. I, I'm just like, I think that paranormal things happen all around us and not one person because i used to think that some people were more prone to have experiences than others and now i'm kind of leaning towards the idea that i think it just happens all around us and like to steal your phrase some brains are filtering it more than others right Right. it's that perceived reality because like i just was telling people i think that some people are more sensitive than others to experience what's already happening around us and I like the whole brain filter thing. So I might steal that and put it on my show sometime. Go for it. Please do. (laughs) Trademark. Believeful. I'll probably forget where I heard it though. I'm just letting you know. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair. That happens all the time. This actually, this reminds me of something else because a lot of people have the same ideas. I think uh, that's kind of a Carl Jung idea. There's like this Jungian super subconscious or something like that where Mm -hmm. people come up with the same ideas because we're all kind of living at the same time. And there is a theory and I wonder what you think about this. I had this thought And since then, I've seen it in mainstream media, but great place to get your information. Well, no, I didn't get the information (laughs) from there. My information is from my own brain. But I had this idea that, you know, Hot Topic obviously is missing 4 and one I'm sure you've talked about it. I have not, actually. You haven't talked about 4 one I've never talked about 4 one Never. Okay. It's because so many other people have had him on as a guest and have talked about it. I'm like, what else am I going to bring to the table other than repeat episode from somebody else? So you're saying. When we talked about it, it was always... Missing 401 came into relationship to an episode we did like dark fairies, like right. uh, experiences in the forest that were strange. Maybe this could be a possible explanation for some people having experiences where the most bizarre of situations, that that sort of thing. But yet we haven't done a specifically, here's someone who disappeared, here's their story. It's more of like relationship to the bizarre aspects right. of what happens in the forest that is unexplained. But what I want to ask you about was specifically, whether it's Missing 401 or Dogman or whatever, you, you get this question about national parks and... I had this thought that, you know, with the missing 401 stuff, they don't keep track of the people that go missing. There's nothing, or you can request a record and it's thousands and thousands of dollars. And my idea was, and I, and I know that people have this because I've seen it since, the idea of containment. Oh, yeah. The idea that some of these things, specifically with Dogman, like we had a Dogman encounter, it was one of the first ones I actually came across, was in Silver Creek, which is nearby where we live in Ohio. And someone had suggested that they maybe were traveling in caves. And we've talked about on our show that if they if they do exist, if they're physical, that's how they can hide and be underground. Because there are cave systems around here. And of course, across the United States, and they haven't all been mapped. A definite possibility that a lot of things can be coming and going through there. And a lot of these caves exist in national parks. And the idea that there is kind of a silence around national parks, there's a certain amount of, you know, this gets a little conspiratorial, of course. But the idea that there is kind of a shutdown of information around national parks. Could national parks be a kind of containment. Yes. Uh, the thing I know that sounds crazy because I just saw an American Horror Story mini episode. They just did this and I thought of you. And they just like, did and I was like, I can't believe that they're, they're talking about this and that was the whole concept of the episode. Explain more about the containment. So the idea is that national parks exist or they, they began. Of course, we had Teddy Roosevelt. I think he was the guy that initiated it. But the idea was that there are certain hotspots, certain gateways to whatever other realms these things might be coming from. I know that sounds crazy, but it's pretty French. Jeremy's crazy corner. I have, I have my crazy <laughs> corner, but The idea that there might be thinnings between, I don't know, realities, uh, whatever existence that some of these things might be coming from, depending on your belief system, 
where there are hotspots, because we do see hotspots, we see clusters, same with Missing 4 and 1, a lot of them around national parks. The idea being that this was identified early on, and the more I talk, the more crazy I know I sound. <laughs> no, uh, you're speaking but, my love language. You're speaking my love language. <laughs> Keep going. So the idea that, yeah, that essentially we created these national parks to observe, control, keep an eye on, tamp down on what might be happening. Because you can shut a park down if there's a problem. You can keep people out. You can watch it. Yeah. The idea that there might be something existing there, a, a gateway, things coming in and out. It's an interesting idea on two parts for me, because one, like you just mentioned, I think it was Teddy Roosevelt who had a... Bigfoot encounter that he relayed, or at least that at that time they didn't call it Bigfoot, but yeah, um, wild man, a wild man with large feet, that a hunter of his that he had he had met or something had this experience. I'm not saying that that's you know that he started this national parks program because of this, but uh, but he did. But that and also you know, we talked about Van Meter visitor coming up out of the caves, this pterodactyl like thing. Like who knows what's down in there, what's down inside the earth. We we've had episodes where we talked about the depth of the hollower areas relatively recently discovered hollow areas of the earth using i forget the t what it was, it was like an echo thing kind of like the jurassic park sort of like ground penetrating oh, yeah on a large scale for the inner earth but finding these vast caverns like is it possible that there are things that exist within the earth that maybe I mean, the containment thing is it out there it's an out there idea but it is uh Interesting. Yeah, Tony, tell me about your love language here. Oh my gosh. Think? Finally. <laughs> I'm just sitting here nodding my head. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> keep going, keep going. Like I'm falling in love, guys. I'm falling in love. <laughs> it's good. So, it's mutual, Tony. Uh, I'm so lonely. Jeez. Listen. All right. So yes. Yes. <laughs> the, the, the cave systems in this country, especially stemming from uh, Kentucky to New York, the mammoth cave system, like yeah. it's huge, man. Like it's not inconceivable to think that anything could seek shelter in a cave let alone something that big and to say that it's impossible for these creatures that people are seeing that they come from living in those big giant caves right it's not impossible to say and who's to say that this idea of the containment and everything what if there are certain areas that are more a thin veil. Exactly. And there are beings and creatures that are able to penetrate that veil and come in from another side that we don't have the ability to do. And maybe these geographical locations are that. Because, I mean, here's the thing. Before we expanded in this country, the entire country was a national park. <laughs> it was all the right. same. You know? Totally preserved. So, so if we identified certain regions that this kind of stuff happens in because of whatever reason, then we can take appropriate action. Now, did they think about portals and all that stuff back then? I don't know. You ever hear of the Eisenhower deal? If it's real, <laughs> right. we've been talking about this stuff for a long time. Yeah. And so, like, to me, it's like, yeah, why not? Because we have Edward Monet said on Chelsea Handler's show, she asked him about the upside down and stranger things and like a joke, ha ha. And he's like, well, actually we do reach into other parallel universes. And she's like, wait, what? And, and <laughs> he's like, yeah, no, we, we do. We, we can, we can do that. And she's like talking about how she wants to go home and hit acid. Like, it, like this <laughs> seems is comparable. Appropriate. <laughs> right. So like we have, <laughs> we have a total shift in consciousness right now in this, in this world. Uh, it's yeah. not just an American thing where science is starting to catch up with the science fiction of our imaginations 50 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And all of a sudden what we thought was impossible and it was just a very good imaginations is now becoming more and more possible. And science is slowly acknowledging that. And then we all also have this idea of disclosure and aliens like the world is changing absolutely and anybody who wants to sit pat and say no it's impossible you're insane <laughs> you're right. insane because the people who run this world are telling you otherwise and you still want to hold on to yesterday because you feel good about it it's like i'm not in it to feel good you know like i'm in it to just have fun and see where this rabbit hole goes. And so when we're talking about the national parks and the portals and, and why can't there be a hollow earth? Right. And if you're a flat earther, why can't the earth be like a bowl where it's flat on top and it's round on the bottom so we can have the hollow earth and the flat earth all <laughs> <Exactly>. together? Like <laughs> one happy family. <laughs> yeah. <I'm> like <laughs> let, Let's just all come together, guys. Like we got enough problems to fight against in this world. We don't need to be mad about the flat earth versus the globe earth versus exactly. the hollow earth. Let's just have some fun. Yeah. And, and the fun Honest part, I think, for us, and like, you know, we dipped a little away from the, the more controversial stuff, I think, because there's so much hate, so much anger yeah. in, into those topics. It is amazing how many people get upset oh, about man. that. Oh, man. Like, the, our first season, the first, like, half of that season what was... What is the moon landing? 
Yeah, yeah. Just oh, yeah. The people so angry. It's, but our whole thing is like, look at the situation, look at it with an open mind. Don't make any claims. You don't know. Like we don't, we don't say this is how it is. We don't sermonize. Everyone about knows it. what they've been told about right. anything. Right. Here is an option. Here is something that's interesting. Here is something that makes you curious. I hope you guys are enjoying the conversation with Tony at Confessionals. This week's expansion is going to be something special. Another long time coming event. Oh, it was very fun. Bigfoot, high strangeness, strange stories of experiences with the hairy guy. And I even enjoyed it. And John even enjoyed it. I'm not a Bigfoot fan, but this was (laughs) interesting. we know. (laughs) Yeah. We had on board, on craft, species zoo involving Bigfoot Mm -hmm. and other creatures. The big cat connection with wild men. We talked about one of the most fantastic, horrifying stories on the darker side of Bigfoot. Yes, yes. You often hear researchers say, well, he's a kind, warm fellow. Don't bother him. He won't bother you. And that's probably largely true. But there are terrifying stories of the Bigfoot, and we have one uh, coming up in the expansion for you guys. Oh, we're doing it. Yeah, we dive into the work of Joshua Cutchin and Timothy Renner with Where the Footprints End and look at some of the highest of the high strangeness when it comes to Bigfoot and strange connections in folklore and contemporary accounts. You guys won't want to miss it. He made his way closer, pushing through the thick vegetation. He could hear it moving away from him, deeper into the woods. Thinking it might be a vagrant or a criminal camping out in the woods, he leveled his gun and said, Come out nice and slow, or I swear to God I'll come out there and shoot you. He was silent for a moment, and then he caught something huge out of the corner of his eye. At first he thought it was a bear, and then suddenly he saw a huge hairy arm with a human-like hand reach out of the brush and grab hold of a small alder tree about five feet up. The thing pulled itself upright out of the bush. It stood on two legs and turned its upper body to glare at John. It was enormous. He said it was well over seven feet tall and at least half that big through the chest. It was too dark to make out many features, but its eyes seemed to glow a deep red. And he thought he could see teeth, like it was curling its lips back. Suddenly, it lunged ahead, pushing back on the tree with tremendous force. The tree snapped loudly and crashed into the trees around it. It then disappeared into the deep brush with frightening speed, sounding like a bulldozer with no engine sounds. I hear you guys have some paranormal experiences. I've been uh, been waiting to hear these stories. I, uh, it's funny because I was listening to your show, Hunter Encounters Dogman, I think is the title of the episode, but you mentioned in there about your experience with this light you've been seeing. And I know that you've, we've kind of talked about that a little bit when you close your eyes. And, but one of the things you mentioned was, you know, you were asking the audience basically rhetorically or not, is this because I'm overworked? And it triggered a memory. Several years ago, I was living in Akron, Ohio in this old apartment building. It was probably built in, I think, late 1800s, mid 1800s. It was called the Belvedere. Sounds creepy, but it wasn't a creepy place. Like I never got a weird vibe from it, never felt strange, but I had this bizarre experience. So one night I was there and I'd been working doing web design, which is kind of what I was doing full time as a freelancer. And I just got this great client, you know, big whale of a client, at least for me. And so I needed to get it done. And they came back. And of course, you don't say no when you are when you get this new client. Instead of two weeks from now, they needed it done three days from now, which is, of course, ridiculous. But, you know, I'm a starving web designer. So what do I do? I, I say, okay, I, I can make it happen. So I'm drinking tons of coffee, taking nootropics, you know, anything I do to like keep myself awake, getting through the nights. And it had been probably about three days, nights where I just hadn't gotten much sleep. One night, It was actually the morning. It was probably right before sun was coming up, so it's got that kind of blue tint in the sky. Just pre-dawn, I literally fell asleep coding. I don't know how that happened, but I'd actually finished some code while passing out, and I woke up, and I was like, okay, I I gotta put this to bed for now. I put it away, get ready for bed, laying down, and I noticed in the corner of my left eye, smoke. And I think, okay, Maybe the building's on fire, which at that point I'm so tired, it's not really bothering me. I get up, walk to the window, open it, look out, and it's dissipated by that point. So, okay, I must be seeing things. I go back to the bed, 
lay down, and probably, I don't know, a minute later, I see the smoke again in the corner of my eye. And this time I don't get up. I just, I just watch it. And I just had this weird feeling that there was some kind of, I don't know, sentience, some kind of consciousness, something that felt like I was being watched in a way. And so I'm laying there. This thing comes in through the window, which is half open because it's summertime in Akron, floats into the window and I'm thinking it's, it's smoke or, or maybe I'm seeing things because I'm tired, but it keeps flowing into my room. And as I'm laying there, I start, <laughs> this is crazy and kind of stupid, especially if you think that maybe it's evil, but I start talking to it in my mind, just like, hi, you know, basically like, can I talk to you? Are you a thing? And no joke, this thing, it's basically like a 15 foot strand of smog smoke swirling into my room. It turns towards me, comes over top of me as I'm laying on my mattress on the floor and hovers like it has some kind of purpose. What I did at this point was, okay, you know, you have a rational brain, everyone throws stuff out. People think you make up stories in your mind and people want to believe, but in reality, most people try to explain things away. That's what I always do. So I'm looking left, I'm looking right, and I think if this is just like a trick of my mind or my eyes are tired, when I move my eye to the left, everything will move to the left. This wavy, smoky thing will move to the left. If I move to the right, I'll move to the right. I moved my eyes in different directions, moved my head, got up. This thing just hovered in my room. That freaked me out a little bit. So I'm, I'm laying there, but I'm more interested than anything. And it comes right over top of me. And I think probably because I was so out of it that I wasn't scared, I lifted my hand up just to see if I could see whatever this material, energetic smoke, whatever, whatever it was, if I could interact with it with my hand. I lift my hand up and I see strands of this thing come in between my fingers. And this is the crazy part, but it wraps around my palm and my palm lights up. You know, the lines, people read lines on your palm or whatever. My palms lit up right along the lines like little starlights. I didn't know what to think at this point. I was so gone. I just kind of accepted it and basically had this weird communication with this thing. It was like a kind of a see you later type deal. And it dissipated and slowly backed out and went out the window the way I came in. And at that point, I thought, well, I can probably reach my arm out and lift up my trash can in the corner of my room. Maybe this gave me some kind of telekinetic power. Of course, this is ridiculous. And I didn't, didn't actually think that was going to happen, but I had hoped because it was just such a bizarre experience. And this was not something that, it wasn't something in my eye. It wasn't a hallucination. And what I truly believe is that there are things that we experience in this world that exist all around us at all times. Like you said, Tony, there is a paranormal reality around us that not everyone is aware of all the time. But I do think things like, like in your case with the white flashes, whatever that was, or your exploding brain, um, your exploding brain, <laughs> or whatever that, that phenomenon is, <laughs> yeah, when you wake up, noise, to, yeah. yeah. Uh, I do think that things like lack of sleep, you think of monks that meditate or starve themselves. I think with certain activities like lack of sleep, maybe you can get your mind in a state where it degrades or removes those filters of reality. And maybe you can see things that you normally can't see. Maybe that was something real. Maybe that's wishful thinking. But I did find uh, a couple weeks later an article, and I think this came from Linda Godfrey, some page in, in one of the back of her books, I think. But essentially it was a very similar experience with this. They called it like a smoke monster or creature entered this guy's house while he was getting ready for bed and it was in Canton, Ohio, which is like, oh, that's weird. You know, 30 minutes away from where I was living, 25 minutes. And that could be complete coincidence. It's one of those experiences that just feels so real. It doesn't leave you on like, you know, any other kind of situation that might happen when you're... I remember you know. when I, you told me that story and you looked demonically possessed. Oh, thanks, John. No, I mean like, <laughs> you just, you had this like weird energy to you. It felt very real. I remember you like smiling when you were telling okay, me. Okay, I was not demonically possessed. No, I didn't mean you were, but you definitely had like an experience that. He's probably but, insecure telling his story. No, of what, no. I remember even telling me, cause you were, you were kind of in a dark place at the time. I remember. Well, living at that place, I was, it was a, it was a rough time. Maybe but, I shouldn't have said that, but that's part, of, part of the story. A little, a little too intimate, John. <laughs> It's interesting. And when you were telling the story, that's what I was thinking. I was like, see, this this goes right into the brain filter idea. You were so tired that maybe your brain filter was degraded or 
not up to snuff and you were able to see things that you typically wouldn't have been able to see. Exactly. Very interesting. I mean, people do deprive themselves of sleep to have psychedelic experiences, spiritual experiences. Yeah. It's not uncommon. It's interesting because yeah. like one of the things we didn't talk about tonight, but it was thinking about talking about was the possible reality of the sky creatures, right? I haven't really connected this before, but your smoke monster, whatever this thing is that you saw, you know, the, the removal of the filter maybe, but there are so many accounts of these things that are cloud-like where people have these experiences where they are moving against the wind or they come down. There's a great one we did in our Sky Creatures episode about a cloud that throws up on a biology teacher. Cloud that throws up on a... Yeah, well, that's what it was described as, but it followed him home. But there's a lot of accounts of this, of things that might be considered UAPs or UFOs. But then you have accounts where people say, well, it acted more like a biological entity. I'm not saying that's what you experienced. It's hard to pin anything down. But it's definitely an intriguing story. Yeah, Tony, what do you, have you heard much about the living sky or the idea that there are things beyond like the technological UFO that there might be living organisms in the sky? Yeah, biological. Yes. Yeah, and over the years I've talked to people about, you know, what I like about my show, but also is hard for me with my show is that I talk to so many people who've had so many different types of different experiences throughout their life. So it's hard. It's not like I have episode 285 was Bigfoot. That's it. And it's like, eh, it was Bigfoot, but they also had the lights and this, that, and the other. Right. But I, we definitely have talked about this idea before, and I have heard about this. And this is a great way to think about it, too, because like we were talking about before about not boxing things into certain categories. What you experience technically could be described as this biological UFO type experience that people have. And it was just more up close and personal. Uh, by the way, I hate the term UAP. Me too, man. <laughs> yeah. They just rebranded it. Yeah. Don't you dare come into our yeah. corner and just start renaming our toys. Okay. <laughs> like, exactly, man. It's not happening. That seems like a power move. Like, oh, well, totally. Oh, yeah. Well, redefine Well, now you language. can take it seriously because I call it UAP. It's almost like yeah. now is the time for us to take it seriously so they can control the narrative right. yep. and they relabel it. Rebrand. Yes. You guys, listen, I don't need to preach to you guys. You guys are already woken up. I get it. <laughs> I, I think got we're it. In the, yeah, on the same page, my I friend. I love it. I freaking love it. But yeah, no, I, I have heard of that. And, you know, it was years ago when I first heard about it. And I was kind of like, what? But there are a lot of people who have experiences with what we just call a UFO, unidentified flying object. Maybe we could call it UFT, unidentified flying thing, you know, like <laughs> right. it, it's in the sky, it's flying, but it seems very biological. And it also seems very aware of me. Exactly. And it makes people feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> UFOs themselves tend to have that kind of attribute where people will say that, you know, I saw this thing and then it swooped down at my car. I saw this thing and it stopped when I locked eyes with it or something like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it's like it has a consciousness about it of some sort. It's interesting. I won't go too long into it. I was going to say, I could tell my UFO story. Yeah, though. please do. Yeah. I just want to say this real quick about okay. that. <laughs> I'm, po I'm pointing at you hard. I know you are. Uh, I like this point. Yeah, the, the sky creature concept is fascinating. And when we came across it, it blew my mind because there are so many accounts of this that do seem to obviously relate unidentified phenomena in the sky where you have these lights that are pulsing, maybe move. You know, you can't explain the, the trajectories, the, the sudden stops and turns, the 90 degree the angles. The consciousness. Right, or the consciousness. Or sometimes even seem alive or aware Organic. of you, right? They say you have this, this feeling, this um, the morphic field of being watched. But it's fascinating. There was a guy, Trevor James Constable, who was a researcher into a lot of stuff but he talked a lot about the living sky. And what I didn't know when we did this episode, but I found through our research was like the size of the sky is incredible. It's like, I don't know how many times larger, like the distance from here to like the higher up atmosphere before you get into that thinning area of the outer atmosphere. It's, I don't know, I remember how many times larger than the ocean. But we always talk about the ocean being this, this bastion of possible life or even in earth or maybe cave systems. When you think about the sky, like if you could have possibly, which is described a lot, biological entities maybe, Things that are up there that seem to, they're luminescent. They, they glow and they disappear. Right. They glow and they disappear. almost. There was a great story we did about a pilot who landed in a mesa in the Sierra Nevadas. They flew down and landed there just to see what this place was like. It was, this was in the 20s. This group lands down there in their jennies, these planes back then. And they land on the top of this mesa. And then descending above them is this, they said like six to eight foot disc-shaped thing, which they think is a craft until it gets closer and they realize it looks organic. And it lands and it's injured. There's a, what they describe as like a bite thing. And it sounds crazy, but there's like a bite out of it. 
It's, Ooh, there's something it's bigger leaking, up there. which I think is fascinating in the account, is it's leaking this molten metal, which you hear a lot in UFO stories. It's breathing up and down, and they see this thing, and then eventually this other one comes and descends and takes this thing away. Fantastic story, obviously. It sounds like something out of a yeah. science fiction magazine, but this is just one crazy example, but allegedly from a reliable source. But it's interesting when you hear these stories about moving in groups or changing shape, right? You hear that in the UFO field a lot. Right, morphing. What if some of these experiences, because I do think there are craft, where they come from, I'm not sure, but I do think it's possible that some of these are actually groups of living entities that people have seen. It's just an interesting angle on it, I think. That's what's always been fascinating to us. So that's what we present is like, here's a curious Just thought. like you yeah. said, Tony, you want to have fun with it. You want to explore these ideas about, it. we don't know what reality is. And yeah, this is a non-traditional explanation for the UFO phenomenon, obviously, but some people are so emotionally connected to knowing what they know that they don't have fun. And if you suggest an idea, it's an affront to their understanding of reality and their ego. It's, well, it's an affront to their worldview, which is very scary to have that challenge for most people. It's Which a I, scary I mean, that. thing to have to reimagine everything that you've ever known was true. But here's the thing, like it doesn't have, like here's the bottom line, guys. All three of you, myself, and every single person listening to me talk right now, guess what? You're going to die one day. That's right. And one day, I don't know, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So I mean, we, we could go, okay. I look at those trans believe in transhumanism. I like it. <laughs> I freaking like it, okay? But <laughs> the, the point is, like, at one point in time, this consciousness that we all experience, however you view it, we are in this consciousness together, it is going to end for every single one of us individually, and there could be something else that happens next, or there could be nothing if you're an atheist. The bottom line is, we all have the same destination on this ride. Yeah. So if that's true then you don't have to be fearful and afraid to explore thought. Like exploring thought is a fun thing. And it's okay if you say, you know what, this is what I believe. And I lean towards this because this, that, and the other. Right. And and that's great. I mean, listen, I'm a, I'm a theistic person. Like I said, I'm a Christian. Like I have certain beliefs, right? But when it comes to like the nuances of belief, for me, it has to be flexible at certain points. And there's certain points that I'm not flexible on. And it would take a lot for me to change. It's not that I would say that I won't change, but it would take a lot for you to present firm evidence to me for me to say that Jesus Christ isn't the Son of God because of what I passionately believe. And everybody should have their own passionate beliefs. But to approach these topics in general and be like, listen, this is what Bigfoot is. And you, you're an idiot if you don't think Bigfoot is just a relic hominid, man. Like, come on, bro. Like, <laughs> right. did you have a powwow with Bigfoot? Did, do you know something that I don't know? You know, and that's the thing that irritates me with a lot of this stuff. Like years ago, when I was running the Facebook group, I went to uh, the Ohio Bigfoot Conference. Uh, shout out to Ohio, you guys over there. Yeah, and, that's right. And so like, I went, you know, and I don't remember what year it is and stuff, but I, I don't really give a crap if anybody ever connects dots in this because I don't care. So if you want to take this out, by the way, you can. I don't, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> we'll, leave it I, but we'll keep the drama, Tony. I, I don't remember the guy's name and I wouldn't drop his name anyways. But my thing is this, I'm there and there's, a very obvious, you know, gear of with some of the speakers, at least the ones that I remember, Bigfoot, physical, Bigfoot, ancient creature, all that stuff. And somebody in the audience there raises their hand. And they ask the question about, you know, Bigfoot being more along the lines of paranormal. I forget how they said it. And this guy just scoffed at this person and just laughed at them and made them feel stupid. And, you know, there's no room for this pseudo this, that, and the other. Yeah. We're trying like mainstream science, this, that, and the other. It's like, bro, you are a joke, man. Like you're a joke because if you were that serious about Bigfoot and you had it all together about Bigfoot that much, the way you're trying to portray yourself in front of all these people and stuff, you would have already had mainstream science in your back pocket, but you don't because you don't got it all together. Don't give me this crap, man. Don't come at people for trying to think about things outside the box or relate their personal experiences to you and you just scoff at it because it doesn't fit in your worldview. I hate that crap, man. Damn right. That's all I, I have I'm to sorry. Say. See, this is what happens <laughs> when I go on other people's shows. I get on like these rants and stuff more because That's I don't got a guide conversation. You guys are just giving me layups. 
<laughs> no, but you're exactly right. We talk about this all the time. One size fits all. Yeah. And like the dogma behind your position on a, for example, a cryptid. Like it can foot. be a religion to some people. Yeah. For some people, it becomes yeah. that. And the scoffing at people. Like, first of all, who does that help? Well, exactly. And whether it's cryptids or conspiracy theories, people are going to make judgments about you as a person sometimes when really... You're just exploring different ideas. Yeah, that, well, that's exactly. That's the curse of an open mind, man. Right? Like, that's a, that's a funny thing, man. Like, I've actually been accused of, it recently, several times actually recently, now that I think about it, of being a Satanist. And I'm like, what? what? <laughs> Welcome to the show. You must be new here. You know, like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm team Jesus 100%. And anybody who's been following me for a long time, like, you, you know that. So you must be new around here. Don't let the logo confuse you. I'm not an Illuminati guy. I just thought it looked cool. Like, <laughs> that's it. Like, the reason why my logo is half white and half black like that is like the shadowing and stuff, because it looks cool. If you want to go down an explanation of it, though. Were they saying like checkerboard or something? Well, no, no. They're, they're saying because the one eye and and this, that, and the other. But if you, oh, if you yeah, left yeah, yeah. covered. Yeah, but if you episode two, I'm believable, <laughs> right? So if you want, if you want to go down that road, I can just say, hey, dude, listen, I'm a Christian, which means I'm exposing what's in the darkness with my light. You know, like we can go down these roads of reading into things all day long. But the fact is, I just thought the logo looked cool. Right. You know, like my artist designed it. He said, I got a good idea. I sent him a picture of my face holding my finger up. He designed it. I was like, perfect. Where do I send a check? Your artist is a Satanist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always the artist that's behind it. There you go. Yeah. No, but you're right, man. Like, yeah, that that looking too hard at things. Well, there, there are a lot of people that I follow on YouTube that I've, you know, for years I've watched stuff and I really like but they'll pull up examples that I'm just like, he can't be serious, man. Yeah. Like this is so coincidental or That's it's, where it it's becomes, not even, a, you know, to say that like every time that something is presented a certain way, it's because it's an Illuminati. Because I do believe, I do personally, this is Jeremy talking for those that, that don't want to. Thanks for the identifier. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> uh, I feel like there's a reality to behind the scenes, the upper echelons, whatever you want to call it, that has an influence on, on our reality. And I think it's a deconstruction of, a spirituality and pushing a material. And I think that a lot that goes into that is the symbolism, is the, if you want to call it Freemasonic Illuminati. I think that there are the higher ups that are involved in that. I think that's happened. I think we can see evidence of that. But you dilute the argument when you pull up examples like your logo, Tony, yeah. or any other show or whatever, someone's doing something where there's a pyramid or whatever, and you, just because there's a symbol. Like, hey, there's a triangle. Exactly. It's a triangle upside down. Well, the guy's name is, you know, I don't know. His name is Andy and he flipped his A upside down. If you take every example that could possibly be interpreted that way and you use that as evidence for your theory, you delegitimize the theory. Yes. And I think that's the problem that we have in our culture. Well, that's where the it becomes you know, conspiratainment or something where it's, right. I'm going to find any possible yes. connection where I know when I'm presenting this, I know people that People get so wrapped up in it too. Yeah. And you know, you just see it everywhere. It is kind of everywhere. It is. You know, in I a mean, real way. I've been there. I understand where they're, yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of the traps you can fall into when you get into this world. It can just keep taking you further and further down the rabbit hole. And sometimes you, you don't really have your bearings. Right. Yeah. And then you get called a Satanist. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think a lot of times it's people who probably just are starting to wake up to this idea that the world isn't what we believed it was growing up and what we've been taught. Right. And all of a sudden you're just like looking for signs everywhere. Exactly. And you're like, oh, I saw a YouTube video about this last month and this look at this guy's logo. He's definitely part of the Illuminati. He's a Satanist. He's a shell. You know, it's just one of those things where uh, if you're not careful and you go down the rabbit hole, you sometimes never come out with a sane mind, you know? And so you got to be careful. Like, yes, the world is bonkers. And yes, there are powerful elites who do bananas things. I don't want to go. I don't know how far I can go on your show. I don't want to get you guys. We've done a few episodes on it. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's real. I have personal experience. I can call a guy right now. I could call a guy right now who can confirm and tell you his life story. I 100% know he's telling me the truth. He's shown me legal documentation, court documents to back up what he tells me. And it backs up everything that we talk about. I'm telling you, it wound up in the court system. Yes, the world is weird. The world is crazy. There are people in high position in this world and authority that dabble in 
things that we would call satanic. Okay, it's you know, real. Marina Abramovich's. Oh yeah, you want to go down that road? We can go down that road. <laughs> well, we could. It's you know what? It's about time we revisit that. Okay. World. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people that have that are drawn to powerful positions tend to want more power. Yeah, well, they tend to be sociopaths. They too. get bored. I mean, the spiritual world is real, whether you want to admit it or not. There's good and light forces in the universe, in my opinion. And if you so, don't believe it, they do. Right, and they practice it. Well, and that's a big point about whether you're talking about like dark witchcraft or Satanism or whatever, it, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. In those situations, in those rare situations where there's evidence of it occurring, where there's damaging results or murderous results, those are people that believe it's happening. You know, whether or not you believe demonic presence around the situation, those people do. That's kind of an important thing to talk about because when you, you, know, you think about a lot of the darker stuff, all the, you know, Satanism, the dark Satanism, because now it's also like a anti- uh, system establishment yeah. movement or whatever right yeah that's fine like i saw like a trailer for that where it's like hey it's all this is this great film it's all about thumbing your nose at authority because we're satanists it's like yeah but you're kind of missing the point here like the people that are protesting you in these small town community city halls they're not doing it because they're disagreeing with your politics they're doing it because they think that you really believe that you're worshiping an evil force uh you know a demonic presence which in their belief system is everything that's evil. Right. Everything that is dark and gross and terrible that hurts humanity. So like, if you're not explaining to them that you're doing this as a political movement, it's not of course even, they're going to have the reaction. But it's not even that because, of course, there is that group, and we've talked about this before, that there are those that are like, hey, we're the political Satanists where, you know, we're rebelling. We want to put up a statue for Baphomet because there's a, the Ten Commandments at the courthouse. We want an equal representation. And then there are the ones that are actually for power killing people in their basements, murdering babies. Well, yeah, that's different. Yep. A lot of terrible, terrible things, they don't associate necessarily with the political, you know, Anton LaVey, Church of Satan, but they are killing for power to Satan, to the devil, whatever you want to call it. Like Allegedly. Separate those, allegedly, but people don't separate those realities. Not allegedly. I do think there is a darkness that goes on, especially at the upper levels. And whether they're organized or not, whatever you want to call it, they harness some dark power they think that they are by doing some terrible, terrible things. We should get Tony's perspective on this. It sounded like you wanted to chime in a little bit before. Well, I mean, here's the thing. So if you lived through 2020 and 2021 and you came out of those two years saying, I trust 100% those in authority <laughs> and I don't think that anybody that has authority in a legal position uh, would do anything sinister or try to manipulate anything for their benefit, then you've probably been living under a rock. And that's just true. Well, they just call you a conspiracy theorist. You can call me a conspiracy theorist. That, and that's another <laughs> thing. Like, oh my goodness. I know. <laughs> let, let, let's just think about this for a second. Anybody, like, and probably the ratio is pretty lopsided here with our audiences and stuff. But if you just sit here and think about it, somebody's like, oh, you sound like a conspiracy theorist. Pause. <laughs> Are you telling me that your government for the last 50 years has always told you the truth and never did anything for their own benefit that might possibly come back negatively on the people that they are ruling over, because that's what it is. And if you just break it down like that, you're telling me they've never lied to you and they've always been truthful and every decision they've ever made was for your benefit, not theirs. If your answer to that is no, which it should be, then you're a conspiracy theorist because they're never going to tell you that they ever did that. Right. So the conspiracy theorist type conversation of trying to degrade, like, listen, you're a buffoon if you just, if that's your argument against somebody. I'm sorry. It's, 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 it's just a silly, silly argument. And we have mainstream media in the past. I'm not going to tell you who it was. Probably there's a lot of people that know, but there is mainstream media in the past when dealing with WikiLeaks went on their programming and said, it is unsafe for you to read these documents. We will read <laughs> it for you and tell you what's inside of it. Oh, yeah. And then tell you what to think, of course. If that doesn't tell you that they are hiding things from you because there is conspiratorial things that you should be aware of that are in those documents that they're protecting themselves from, you're crazy. But also, if it doesn't scream at you that that means that you're being manipulated and brainwashed, I don't know what to tell you. They literally can tell you to your face what they're doing and nothing changes. Yeah. It's because the propaganda is strong, my friends. It's like the force. How ironic is it that the term conspiracy theorist is an orchestrated conspiracy? 
Just the, the labeling term itself yes. and the way it's been pushed yes. as propaganda to delegitimize anyone that questions anything. Yeah, that's admitted. That's, I just think that's funny. Thanks, George. Yeah. Rest in peace. <laughs> Rest in peace, George. Yeah, it's easy to say conspiracy theorists. And that's, you know, by the way, conspiracy theories happen every single day. A couple of people getting together to plot. Yeah, it happens know. literally every day what in a- government and there's no question about it. But when it's something that you're not supposed to ask questions about, then the term comes up. Then it's a conspiracy. Right. It's just a conspiracy yeah. theory. What always blows my mind too is it seems like, you know, especially when they just, what was it? Was it last year or two years ago? I remember we were very aware of this because the FBI just designated the term conspiracy theory, like a Mm -hmm. domestic terrorist phrase or something like that. I was like, great. That's in our title. (laughs) You guys, (laughs) This is going to be an issue, which is ridiculous, man. Like the whole point, I mean, to me, conspiracy theory, first of all, yeah, it's a theory, but it's not always a theory. A conspiracy is identified in a court of law and you cannot have a conspiracy unless there is a conspiracy theory, right? You can't, people have to conspire. And in order to prove that, you have to have a theory of it. You have to be skeptical, suspicious, and Prove it. You just described any good detective. That's what a detective does. Exactly. Yeah. And here's the thing. So after the uh, Christmas bombing in Nashville, Mm -hmm. I told people, be careful because the term conspiracy terrorist is going to be something that pops up in your life now. And uh, it has, you know, maybe they call it more just domestic terrorism. But uh, here's the thing. So when it comes to the term of conspiracy theorist, there, as far as I can kind of tell, three stages of its existence. Okay. And for a long time, it was the last stage. You're a conspiracy theorist. Ha! You're silly. You're dumb. <laughs> then it went to, oh, we're getting a little closer to the truth. So now let's, and this is again, the propaganda arm at work. Let's propagate the people to do things and say things a certain way. So now we're going to propagate them from looking at conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists as laughable to let's shun them. Let's make them scared to talk about it. Yeah. Laughing at them wasn't enough, but now they're getting a little closer. So let's shun them. Now they're dangerous. Right. And that was the next step. The third stage, as it gets closer and closer now, okay, shunning didn't work. Laughing at our people that we have propagated that are brainwashed. We need to keep them away from the conspiracy theorists. So now they need to fear them. And that's where we're at now. They tried. They can't stop the people digging into the dirt. They can't stop the people from unraveling the truth. So what they do now is the remaining people, they are manipulating to get them to fear conspiracy theorists to keep them away. And it's actually dividing families. Yeah. Down to the families, it's dividing them. That's absolutely true. Like the idea that you can't even talk about these things. Well, as soon as you say any keyword that the mainstream media has given you, obedient observer, watching their programs, any keyword that maybe a family member says or a concept someone questions, you immediately know them as a conspiracy theorist. And then you can begin to either be afraid or begin to try to correct their opinion. But there's no thought that maybe you have something to learn. It becomes a complete division because of brainwashing from the mainstream media. At least that's how I feel about it. Yeah. No, I agree. I think I think uh, this is a match made in heaven, guys. I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, w- I was expecting to talk about um, you know poltergeist activity and uh, you know some uh, monster we got dog stories man in there. We got some good dog. We get some good dog man. That's what I love about your show, Tony. Is like you span the gamut, man. Like I've listened to some of your episodes, and uh, I love that there's no real off button topics. No. Like anything in the paranormal, and like I know that you lean in the conspiratorial, and like that's our show in different fashions, but we all seem to resonate in the same way. Conspiracy analytical. That's what it is. Uh, And here's the thing, man. Like, I just, I talk to people. You know, I've had Satanists on the show. I've had witches on the show. And I've had more Satanists on the show that people don't even know were Satanists because it just wasn't part of the conversation than I had that were Satanists on the show that they were making it known that they were Satanists on the show. And so, like, it's, dude, I don't care. I don't care. I'm very firm in who I am as a person, as a man, and as what I believe. (laughs) And so like, I don't really care who I'm talking to. Are you interesting? Cool. Let's talk. It's a great perspective to have. To us, it's always about the story. It's about the story. It's about bringing the information and bringing interesting, sometimes fantastical sort of account and then telling that story. And with our show specifically, we do a lot of, you know, let's look at this through a lens of what research is there and what can we find that's a new angle? What can we find that is something that maybe hasn't been talked about before? And how does that, is there, is there a reality to it? Can we discuss that? Whatever the topic might be. But uh, yeah, that open-mindedness is what's super important. Yeah, I and I think that you have people with completely different perspectives and experiences coming onto your show because you have that authentic approach. People hear what you're, how you're communicating with your guests. You're one of the best listeners of any interview I've heard because you just will let them talk. 
you're not coaching people. It's just a conversation. You want to get their story. And, and that's such a refreshing breath of fresh air, not NPR style. You're so you know, refreshing, Tony. It's funny you say that because <laughs> uh, somebody, I think it was on YouTube, somebody recently said, does anybody get to, this in the comments? Does anybody get the sense of that Tony's not even listening? And it's like, no, I'm <laughs> listening. I'm just letting them talk. If Here's the thing. I don't need to talk. So if somebody comes on the show and they just start talking and they run with it and two hours later we're calling it a wraps and I'm just like, hey, this is Chris, everybody. Ba 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 ba. Two hours later. Thanks for joining us, Chris. I'm good with that. Like I don't need to put my two cents in on things. It's literally a platform for everyday normal people to come forward and share their stories. And I'm just here to present that platform. And if they need the conversation, they need me to bounce back and forth with them to get the story out. Cool. I can do that. But if you just want me to sit and be a listening ear, I can do that too. I'm good with it. It doesn't mean I'm not listening. It just means I'm listening. You know? yeah, well, that's what, that's what a confessional is. And it's also a good interview. Yeah. You do have the perfect name, the confessionals. I appreciate that because I've been second guessing the name recently. My wife told me that she feels like it's not the best name for what I do. And other people have said that recently. And I'm like, five years into the game, I'm just like, I don't, I don't think I can change it now. Yeah, it's, you're uh, in it to win it, man. I was going to suggest talk time with Tony. Talk time. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> it's funny, Tony, because we actually, after thinking about how good your name was, I was considering starting a branch off show where we do long form interviews with people and calling it. The confession hole. Oh, here he goes. <laughs> the confession hole. Listen. And there would be no confusion. Yeah, none, none at all. That wasn't pre-thought up joke, was it? No, I didn't think about that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I could tell my UFO story. Yeah, though. please do. Yeah. It changed my life. It was kind of the... Because you guys were always into the paranormal stuff. I mean, I did have other things happen when I was younger, but I wasn't into the Bigfoot. I didn't care about ghosts. Right. You, you know. were a soccer star. I was into sports. I just didn't. I didn't have that interest growing up. I just didn't care. But this, <laughs> this, <laughs> this changed cool everything. And this was, I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe not quite that long, but I had just moved to Austin, Texas with a good friend from high school. I had to get out of Seattle. I had lived in Seattle for a couple of years and I just needed to change. And so I had moved to Austin right on the border of University of Texas, Austin. And it was summertime and all the students were gone. It was an awesome place to live just to be right on campus there. And it was just this beautiful campus. And the first couple of weeks, I was just kind of getting my bearings and I had a bike and I would just ride up and down the empty streets of the university. One night I was riding around and I came over the hill in the middle of the campus that led down to the stadium and got to the bottom of the hill, got off my bike, and I was just kind of looking at, they were renovating the stadium. They were adding like, it just looked like a fortress, I remember. They were adding around the building, like every side. And I was just staring up at the stadium, just kind of contemplating my life and just like, you know, conspiracy theories. Cause I was still somewhat new into that world at the time. And it was kind of still, earth shattering for me a little bit some of the concepts we used oh, to yeah. talk about at the beginning and as I was looking up I remember there was a crane that I was kind of looking up at and I noticed like a twinkling kind of thing behind it it caught my eye and it was it was fairly large and I looked at it and it was it's hard to explain the feeling of something like that I, at first I thought it was like a reflection or something I thought it was like a piece of glass up there that was reflecting off of it. But after I looked at it for like a, a second or two, I knew it did not fit into anything I'd ever seen before. It was a typical triangle shape. It had three, they looked like glowing balls of light. They were pulsating. That's the only way I can describe it, like fireballs almost. Molten. Yeah. All of a sudden it started shooting across the sky. It was shooting, but it was also blinking in and out. I always describe it as the way a mosquito moves. Like if, if there's a mosquito flying around you and it, you like lose track of it for a second and it's somewhere else, that's how it was moving. And it was moving almost instantaneously to different parts of the sky. And when that happened, you can't really explain the feeling when something doesn't fit into your brain your whole life. You know, you just, it's freaky. You know, I imagine it's the way 
when someone sees a ghost or something. Or a dog man. Same exact uh, Yeah, it just doesn't fit into your reality. Yeah. Your mind is like racing through all the things that it could possibly be. It breaks your brain, just lets in the fear. Yeah, I mean, it's just shock. And so I didn't know how to put it in anything. And so the best thing I thought I could do was get on my bike and ride away. <laughs> <laughs> And so I hopped on the bike and I just pedaled as fast as I could. And I stopped about 20 seconds later because I was just, I had to look back again and it was gone. Isn't it interesting how your reaction and your brother's reaction were total opposites? I mean, he's just like, hi, buddy. How are you? (laughs) I was very sleep deprived, so. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, a different scenario too, but I know what you're saying. I think Jeremy was in a much different state of mind. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't really afraid, honestly, when it happened. It was just more like, it's kind of hard to explain. I, I think until you actually, I, first of all, I did not think that UFOs were real at the time That's either. what I was about to say. Like you weren't into any of that stuff. No. And I, I mean, if I saw it now, like I got obsessed with it after that. Like, you got an implant. Oh, that's a whole other He's story. He's got an implant in his ear, guys. <laughs> what? I don't know what it is. <laughs> you have a weird connection with Whitley Strieber? Yeah, oh, I forgot. You guys about are on the same craft, right? I don't know. I have something <laughs> in my ear that appeared after these sightings. I just don't know what it is. I think it's. A are pimple. you serious? Also had like a David Icke type download. Oh yeah, I had like I thought what were like downloads for like months after that. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, my life definitely took a very weird turn. I remember you telling me that. You kept telling me like I would visit you and be like, dude, I'm being prepared right now. Like you were <laughs> so sure about what. Well, was- I just didn't know what was going on. I actually. I hear a lot of people that go through those experience. They they feel like they get downloads and stuff. So I don't know. I mean, did it prepare me to do the show someday? I don't know. <laughs> That's interesting. But yeah, it was definitely a lot of psychic stuff too. Like Whitley Strieber, that popped into my head one day when I was like just the name. feeling my ear. You didn't know who he was. No, I didn't just know the who name he was. Popped the in name your head. popped in my head and I looked him up and he was talking I about remember implants. That. Yeah, it's so weird. So I don't know what it is, but it's definitely wasn't there before. And it's just this long... Almost like, I don't know how to describe it. It's like a long tubular thing right next to the cartilage in my ear. It's never changed size. You never had gauged earrings or anything? No, it's long and thin and like tubular. It's right right oh. here. Well, we'll have a picture of the show notes. <laughs> no, I don't like feeling it. I haven't thought about it in a long time. I, it totally freaked me out for years. And wow. then I just got used to it. But it's still there. Yo, man, you were abducted. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> Definitely not impossible. It's funny that people, they have like these experiences and stuff. And I'm not saying, like, listen, I mean, I was just kidding. I mean, maybe you were abducted. No, I, I mean, I trust me. This thought has yeah. crossed my mind a million times before. People were like, well, I didn't have missing time. And it's like, but you don't need to have missing time to be abducted because there's plenty of people out there that talk about abductions and getting placed back into the time that they were taken from. Right, yeah, especially right if, back. if they have some kind of time manipulation. Not even time manipulation. What if these beings are just outside of the time that we know? What if for them, their existence is like just driving down a highway and the hash marks on the side of the highway resemble 100 years and they could pull off into any hash mark at any point and just pick a spot and just be there? they might have a total different concept of time that they're basically on the outside and they can access time at any point at will. So if you look at like, there's so many different aspects of cultural beliefs that relate to that. Like think about fairy lore, fae folk, right? They take you away for a period of time. In that period of time, you can spend years there right? and you come back and you're an hour later. Or it could be a hundred years later. And right. You- and that's just one example. But yeah, who knows? You're abducted, John. It's not impossible. (laughs) Title of the episode, John's Abducted. (laughs) I hope it doesn't happen anymore. Oh, I forgot about that. Remember when I used to wake up and there'd be little drops of blood in my ear? Oh my gosh, bro. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Tony. You're waking up all kinds of (laughs) traumatic memories That happened last last season, remember? You you brought that up. Yeah, right in the same place, there'd be like a little crusty like scab almost Mm. too. Right in the same place, like probably three or four times. Good times. Man, you- <laughs> Good times. You seem all right. Thanks a lot, Tony. I want to tap into your consciousness for a couple hours <laughs> on the show. <laughs> Jeez. Before we go here, I'm just curious, have you ever dove into the near-death experience topic? Yeah. I'm kind of obsessed with it right now. I'm going to be starting to like interview some people. I'm just curious, did you do any shows on it? What are your thoughts on the whole thing? Yeah, I've done a couple shows. One, I think was... It had island in the title. If that, if that helps, we can look that up. Uh, 
on the website, just for you guys to know your audience and even uh, my audience, there is a search bar. And if you just type in keywords, and you think it had this in the title, it'll pull it up. So I just did it. Uh, episode 266 <laughs> is called Hell, Heaven and Back. And that one is where I had a guy and his wife come on and she was there when he died. He was dead for about 30, 45 minutes. He came back to life. And when he came back to life, he started telling people what he saw on the other side. And uh, he went to hell, he went to heaven, and then he came back. And uh, so I would say I would start with that one because that one, if you want to talk about rankings of legendary responses, that that one, I bet. people really dug it. But I, I feel like episode 122, Island of Lost Souls, was something along those lines. It just sticks out in my head. And that's why I wanted to say, but yeah, we've talked about it on the show. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there that have these types of experiences. And, you know, it's literally life changing transformation type things. Where oh, for sure. Yeah. Everyone that goes through it, it's like, yeah. When they recount their stories, they never forget any details. It's like it just happened the other day. There's like so powerful and transformative. I've listened to some audiobooks about it, and it, there's definitely a lot more positive ones than negative ones, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't just more people that don't talk about the negative ones right. because it's so terrifying. So I have kind of mixed feelings, but the amazing ones, which a lot of people do have, are unbelievable stories of just these amazingly beautiful places that it seems like a lot of souls occupy after this. You know, it's one of those things where the way they describe it is, one, it's hard to comprehend what they're describing, right? but you get the sense that what they're describing is ultimate utter peace and it's not familiar. It's not what we can even comprehend right now. But when you experience it, you don't ever want to leave it. And you're sad that you had to leave. Yeah. It's like, don't send me back. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people that kind of were not forced to go back, but they were like, you kind of have to go back if you Hang want to not mess up all these other people's lives that we're hoping you'd stick around through the process. <laughs> it's interesting. We did a couple episodes in season two, near death experiences and the related out of body. And some of the stories that I thought were interesting were ones where it seemed like there was a clerical error. I don't remember oh, these, yeah. John. Mm -hmm. It was like someone who was in a hospital who died and came back. His account was that they got the right name, but they said, it's not your time yet. And, but then later that day or the following day, someone else in the hospital with the same name died and did not come back. It was almost like a clerical error kind of thing. And a lot of these accounts were reported by Raymond Moody. I don't know if you're familiar with him at all, Tony, but he, he did a lot of really good research in hospitals with doctors who had experiences, talked about shared near-death experiences, which I think are some of the most fascinating accounts oh, because for sure. there are people in the room who also sometimes see a life review of the loved one that's Even dying. though they're not dying. Even though they're not dying. A lot of these experiences, and of course you hear stories of nurses where you know they're with someone who's dying and then a mist leaves. Like there's a lot of those accounts with medical professionals. But yeah, when it's, when it's a shared life review or a shared light or a shared otherworldly music, that sort of thing, that, that's always fascinating. I just want to say this real quick. Um, apparently, my wife did this in 2019. I don't. I didn't know this, but <laughs> she wrote a blog. Uh, Ten amazing accounts of transcendent near death experiences, and five that are horrifying. So maybe <laughs> maybe people want awesome. to check that out. Is that that's a blog post? Yeah, just type in NDE because that's what I typed in, and it popped it up. So I'll put it in the show notes for I got, sure. I got to thank your wife, uh, Lindsay. That's her name, right, Lindsay? Yeah, Lindsay with an A. Lindsay with an A. Yeah. I don't know how I came across this, but when I reached out and you were down to do this conversation, I just wondered if I had any reference, because I know that we had listeners that reached out and said, check out the confessionals, you guys should talk. And I searched our database and found that in one of our episodes, The Giant of Kandahar, which was an expansion episode, like a paid episode on our end, uh, I had used a blog post by Lindsay for a resource. Oh, she wrote it? Yeah, I think, I think awesome. that yeah. she wrote it, because I, I found that I was like, oh, confessionals. And then I saw the top Lindsay and it had like, Someone, I don't think it was you, someone read the blog, yeah. like an audio version at the top, which was really cool. But yeah, so thank you for that. Thank you for actually putting out research and information. And I think you had, did you have- He's Ellen? like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't remember had. this at all. Uh, the Giant of Kandahar. I think, did you have Ellie Marzulli on? I feel like yeah. you did. Yeah, twice. Okay. Uh, I had him for episode 18 and I was stunned that he would come on my show. It's for being such a new show, but LA gets it. If somebody wants to give you attention, <laughs> you take it. And, uh, and then he came on again and 
um, pissed a lot of people off with the things he said. So yeah, Ellie <laughs> Rizzoli. <laughs> Seems like that kind of guy, but yeah. uh, <laughs> well, we should probably wrap it up because we're going to have a lot of editing to do, but um, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got, we've got more stories. Maybe someday we'll tell them to you, Tony. Uh, Part two. I've had some weird experiences. Uh, out of body experience would have been the one I would have no done. No one cares. Chris. I know one cares. <laughs> I've told it many times on the show before, but definitely changed my life. And we'd love to get some more of your stories, Tony. And if you ever want to talk again, we're definitely down. Seems like oh, we're yeah. definitely the same kin. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having this conversation with us. Absolutely. This has been awesome and hope to do it again. We will definitely do it again for sure. Awesome, man. Well, have a good night. We'll talk to you later. All right, guys. I'll talk to you later. Thanks. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Tony, Confessional Podcast. You better have enjoyed it. You're going to get it. You're going to get John, it. John, the discipliner. Yeah, we had a great time. Stick around for next episode. We'll be back to our regularly scheduled That's programming. That's a long time to stick around. Yeah. That's like two weeks. We'll see you next time for our regularly scheduled next episode, which will be on bizarre twin experiences? Phenomena, maybe. The twin thing. The twin thing. We'll share some of our personal experiences. We'll also have crazy connection with synchronicity and twins, chronobiology, which is a fascinating concept. You hear stories all the time about twins being separated at birth and then end up marrying wives of the same name that have the same jobs, We're both wearing rubber bands on their arms. I mean, those are the most of the mundane. We're going to get into some crazy stuff. Yeah, we'll be talking to Heather and potentially Scott from Freaky Deaky. Heather was born a twin, actually. And I don't want to give too much away, but she has a really fascinating story. So that'll be on the upcoming episode Yeah, that episode is actually well. really interesting. So that'll be a lot of fun. So stick around for that, guys. Uh, tune in next time on The Belief. Oh. Get it.